so we, we're going to start off just with, uh, or I, I want to start off with this kind of um, story. It's kind of an analogy, but um, what I'm going to do is talk about the two, kind of go in two parts, a biblical ordering of four principles of justice. So I'm going to make that case quickly. And then the second part, I'm going to talk about the new Jim Crow and a little bit of uh, the issues of police brutality and criminal justice. So what is a godly response to all that we see going on here? So um, let me begin by, by giving you this little story here. So this is, um, <laughs> this is my daughter Zoe, John's sister, when she was just born. And uh, this is John, who is two years older than Zoe, playing with her. And uh, this is an acorn. And this was an acorn that uh, John picked up on the way to, it wasn't this actual acorn, sorry. But uh, anyway, so, um, but this was an acorn that he picked up on the way to see Zoe and meet her for the first time. When she was first born, she was born C-section at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And, uh, you know, I, I brought John to see Zoe the next morning. Now, Ming and I were both really nervous, actually. Um, you know, how would John be as a big brother and just entering into that role? Because, you know, we had read certain things about sibling rivalry. And we thought, okay, you know, we're prepared for him to regress, right? Like, kind of be jealous or whatever. <laughs> And, and or just be mad that now you know he has to share mom and dad with this new, uh, with this new brand new sister. But uh, that's why this was really touching. Is that when he grabbed the acorn and, and held it up in his two-year-old self, uh, he he said for Zoe, and uh, that was the first that was the first two-syllable word that he ever said smoothly, Zoe. And then when we brought Zoe home from the hospital, uh, John would wake up and say, where's Zoe? Where's Zoe? And want to play with Zoe and play with his little sister. And uh, he was really awesome. And that relieved us as parents because, of course, there's this question of, is this, is the first child, you know, going to share in the love and the welcome and the excitement and the joy that we have in, like, welcoming child number two? And I don't know what your birth order is necessarily, but that's probably something that crossed your parents' minds. Of like, hmm, how's that? How's this going to work? Is every child here going to participate in the love that we have and the vision that we have for our family? So uh, you know, this later, this is them playing in the crib, and, and this is a few years ago because uh, what, they were playing a duet on the piano because we are Asian and we play the piano. That is part of our vision as like a family, that we be musical together. But uh, in all seriousness, that, that is kind of the basic question of, well, what is the vision here? Who, who gets to set the basic vision for relationships? And that's the, the thing that I want you to carry into the question of justice, because it ultimately it is just a question of relationship. And what's the vision for relationship here? And if, there, if God has a vision, this God we worship and we're getting to know, what is that vision? A vision for all kinds of relationships. Friendships, for marriage relationships, for family, in terms of a biological family, uh, economic relationships, political relationships, like what kinds of rights do we uh, share with one another? Who do we give uh, rights to? And relationships involving historic injustice. What do we do about them? Is there anything that we can do? So those are huge. Now, the, the four principles of justice that I want to introduce you to, if you haven't heard this from me already, are the following. Uh, what is the most just way to treat someone? So is it according to what they do in terms of actions? That's meritocratic or meritocratic retributive justice, depending on whether you're doing something good or bad. Right? You merit something or you someone takes retribution on you. I, and, and I just want to say that is a form of justice, even though that's not often uh, talked about explicitly, or I think it's just taken for granted, right? I mean, if you're uh, taking a test and you do well enough to get an A, but for whatever reason, your professor gives you or your teacher gives you a B or a C, it's unjustified. That would be an injustice, and you would be in your rights, you'd be within your rights to complain. 
because it's not what you deserve. Does that make sense? So second is distributive justice, which is need-based, which uh, Connie alluded to. What is, what do we need just as human beings, and what do we deserve because of our worth as human beings, whether it be clean air, food, and water. So most people would say, yeah, something like that. Uh, do, we, do we include public education in there? Well, I guess if we're going to have a functioning democracy and we want things like uh, you know, having a jury of your peers, then, then yeah, we need to make sure we have an educated community around. Do we include health care and public? Well, you know, we're debating that, I suppose. But whatever you put into the bucket, that bucket is distributive justice. It's what do we need as human beings. The third principle is libertarian justice, which is based on our inherent freedom and liberty. So, you know, if you're about 25 or you reach that age and your parents say, this is who we want you to marry, and this is what career we want you to have, you might have a lot to say about that. But one of those things is that's just unjust. How could you, at this point in my life, tell me these things? I mean, I understand you may have opinions. But to tell me, to, that's just unjust, right? Because we believe something about freedom, that I'm an individual. And then there's restorative justice, which proceeds not out of an individual-centered uh, approach, but out of a uh, question of what is the vision for healthy relationship here? So why is it that you can stop me from selling my U.S. passport on the open market? How come I'm not free to do that? Well, it's because there's something called citizenship that we share in and that there's a vision for. And that has to do with having some kind of common cultural context to make our society work and also some security questions. Right? So, so Regardless of the fact of uh, how I feel about it, like I didn't, I didn't volunteer to give those rights away, uh, just by the fact that I'm born in this country and that I continue to live here. That is what I have to accept. There is a vision for relationship here. That's kind of a minimalist approach, but that's where it starts. So there are four principles of justice. And this is where we start to understand why it is that Republicans and Democrats have a hard time talking to each other. Because in a secular frame of, of thinking or an approach to these questions, there isn't a way to organize these four principles. So Republicans tend to say that the first uh, principle is libertarian justice, and the second is meritocratic. Right? So folks like uh, Ron Paul and his son Rand Paul, I know as well as from Kentucky, give it a shout out. I mean, there are some things that, there, and there are some things that I appreciate about that. And I'm not, I, I don't intend to disparage just the whole thing. Democrats, on the other hand, tend to say that it's a combination of these three. You know, and sometimes it's not well organized, but uh, we have a libertarian morality, for instance, and then a stronger sense of distributive justice, and then everyone believes that in meritocratic retributive justice in some way, right? That you gotta work, you break the law, there should be some punishment or some kind of consequence. And, and almost no one starts over here or explores the restorative justice question. So I set this up, uh, these, these images and these questions up at Harvard Law School a few years ago and, and did this, and a lot of people uh, took this survey, and this was the last question. Why should your definition of justice prevail? And most people put this philosophical foundation that, in other words, whatever they thought of the, the, the way we organize those four principles, they had a philosophical foundation that tells them how to do it. And I asked, really? Tell me what that is, because I don't see it, at least not in a secular framework. And when I pushed them, they said, you know, I, I don't know either. I didn't take jurisprudence yet. <laughs> or or though, for those who did, they actually said, you, you are asking the fundamental question of jurisprudence, which is, yeah, uh, we don't know. We don't know how to do this. And so I said, you should really have put your answer here then. 
there is no justice, quote unquote, only power, which is my revision of the quotation from Harry Potter book one, where Professor Quirrell says, there is no good and evil, Harry, only power, and those too afraid to use it. So uh, that's, a, that's a cynical view. But push come to shove, why is it not that? And most people, when, they, when, I, when I said that, they became uncomfortable because it's, it's hard to admit, it's weird to admit that, yeah, I just want to be in power so I can impose my version of the order of these four things. Uh, because we, we believe, or the way we talk, we talk as if justice is this higher thing, right? It's bigger than us, it's higher than us. And we, we kind of fit in under it, or we adhere to it, or we have to grow to accept it. Uh, but to, to even in our language say that, mm, maybe it's just power, maybe it just all reduces any power after all. That is hard. So um, what order is this? And uh, I'm just gonna zoom through here. The first thing I want to say is, uh, in Christian faith, I believe there is an order to it. I believe restorative is first, distributive is second, meritocratic retributive is third, and libertarian is fourth. I think there's a place for all four, but that's, that, that's the order, and here's why. Uh, Jesus said that he was restoring relationships to the way things were in the creation on forgiveness and reconciliation, on marriage and sexuality, on wealth, and in terms of sharing power and honor. Here's an example. When Pharisees asked Jesus, hey, what about divorce? And there's that clause that in Deuteronomy 24 that Moses threw out there, we can divorce our wives, right? For any reason at all, right? And Jesus says, well, no. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning and he goes, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce, but from the beginning. See what he's referencing. He's not only saying, well, what does the Jewish law say from Sinai onward? He's actually saying, before Sinai, long before Sinai, there was the garden. And God had a vision for relationship. And uh, wealth was to be shared, right? So there's radical generosity. This is the story of the rich young ruler. So I don't have time to get into, but Jesus says, in the regeneration, or in the regenesis, it will be like this. So those are just two examples. Uh, you, may, you might ask, why do I put distributed before meritocratic? Uh, let me just talk about this for a moment. In Proverbs 10, verse 4, there is a saying that says, basically, if you don't work, you don't eat. Now, American evangelicals love that verse. They love that verse because it kind of comports with meritocratic retributive justice, which on some level everyone gets behind and is just easy to talk about. But what was the context for that? The context was in Israel, God said, I'm re-gifting you the garden land. You're, you're kind of a new Adam and Eve, or a variation on Adam and Eve, a partial restoration of what humanity should have been and could have been. So here's what I'm going to do. Every 50 years, it, if land changes hands, I'm going to press a reset button in Leviticus 25 called the Jubilee. And that Jubilee reset button is land goes back to the original family boundaries. That's not the only form of wealth. There's livestock, there's clothes, there's other things. But land is the thing that we don't mess around with because God's saying, you're all my kids. And I get to re-gift the garden to all my kids. You don't get to pass down inequality down to the children and grandchildren of Israel because you're all mine. That's my vision. Okay. And Deuteronomy 15 and 24 are basically what do you do during the interim Right, where if poor people, if people become poor in between the jubilees, and then Isaiah 58 is apparently what God says when they don't observe either of those things. He's mad. It's like you're not doing right by my kids. Okay, so distributive justice, in the basic, at least in this form uh, of Israel, is takes the form of land. Land is also is is nutrition. 
its uh, peace of mind and therefore a basic level of mental health. It's economic and it's a work opportunity. And God is giving all that. And so, yes, Proverbs 10.4 says, yeah, okay, once, if, land, if the issue of land is kind of stable, then, yeah, if you don't work, you don't eat. Like, come on, what do I have to do? You've got you to gotta do something here. But it doesn't, uh, you can't just invoke that whenever you want. Does that make sense? There's a context. And so what I'm helping you to do, and what I'm asking of you is, I know this is hard because we're not often equipped to read scripture in a logical way, in a way that synthesizes all these different passages, but we have to, because we have to get at these questions. The church, there's something similar going on, but we're not, the church is not a land-based community. Uh, the dominant image is that of a table. We all sit at the table, Jesus is the host, he provides the food through us, and so if someone says, hey, can you pass the bread? Can you pass me some food? Who are we to say no? Right? I mean, that's the, the image of what the church community is supposed to be like. And even in the New Testament, there is the principle of if you don't work, you don't eat. That is what 2 Thessalonians 3 is about. Some people, I guess, were hanging out, waiting for Jesus to come back and doing nothing. And in response to that, yeah, Paul says, look, uh, you can't do that. But the question of distributive justice happens first. It's before meritocratic justice. And uh, distributive justice needs to be satisfied in order for meritocratic justice to actually be meaningful. Okay, so that's, that, those are examples of the word. They talked a little bit about libertarian justice. Um, Individualism, it is not the highest principle. I'll just say that. Now, and but there are very legitimate concerns like freedom of religious conscience. That actually comes out of Roger Williams, who's my hero in American history. In his debate with John Winthrop, the Puritan who wanted a theocracy, like everyone should believe what Puritans believe. And Roger Williams is like, no, I'm a Christian. I'm an ordained Baptist minister. I'm going to help Jews set up a synagogue. I'm going to help exiles flee to Rhode Island. I'm going to help people you call witches escape you. So, you know, they need some place to live. I'm going to reach out to Native Americans. And so he just did a whole bunch of things that I admire. Uh, and, and there is uh, a very important principle of freedom of religious conscience in Romans 9 through 11. Uh, so this is, this is my case. OK? And there, I think there's a theological foundation. Now, before you're going to say, like, uh, do you believe in a theocracy? Like, no. No. And that's why the uh, freedom of religious conscience is important. But there, uh, as we get into the second part, uh, I, I want to make the distinction between other harm and self-harm. Right? The, the, the definition of harm is actually a very inescapably religious thing. And yeah, that is, that is a, a debate that Christians need to have with the wider public. And we need to be upfront about that. Uh, so, but I think that's how we engage. Okay, so that's the big picture. Any questions so far? All right. So this past week has just been really hard. Uh, to, to watch the news. Police brutality, there's uh, Terrence Crutcher, uh, Keith Scott, and, and just other things going on. So um, I want to give us some context. What, what is this that we're observing? Uh, part of it is that the US uh, is the incarceration capital of the world. There are reasons for why that is uh, from a social point of view. But in the in, Kind of in the last few decades, uh, Michelle Alexander, who is a constitutional law professor, uh, who is now at Union Seminary filling out the religious side of her constitutional law work, uh, has pointed out that this is a new Jim Crow, that there are ways in which uh, mass incarceration, especially of black and brown men, but also uh, folks who, who are not black and brown, I mean, this, this affects a lot of other people have been kind of 
netted up in a, a large sting operation. And um, this is called the War on Drugs, so which it is uh, kind of at its foundation, a new legalized system of racial discrimination and social exclusion. Uh, I'll just give some highlights, or lowlights, I guess, if you want to call that. So John Ehrlichman was a former Nixon aide, and he, la just a few months ago, during the summer, admitted you know, uh, during the spring, admitted this. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war, Vietnam, or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, right? Because those were the communities that were against uh, Nixon and what he was talking we could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. That is, that is the frankest admission that I've seen. And others basically have said that, but not as frankly. Uh, so I, if you're interested, I can point you to that. Uh, this gentleman, uh, Matthew Fogg, was the Department of, of the Drug, he was a Drug Enforcement Agent. And um, he, you should listen to his YouTube uh, confession about how he was directed by his higher ups to go raid, um, look for drugs in poor and in black communities and not in the wealthy, let's say, white fraternities, right, of Washington, D.C., that area and all the colleges and universities there or the, the wealthier suburbs. Basically, it was all there. And um, he says, we were, we were targeting people. Because it met a quota, we'd get rewarded, and uh, we'd get bonuses. And besides, if we you know, started rounding up uh, the sons and daughters of wealthy people, well, they know lawyers, they know judges, and we'll, we, there go our bonuses. So. Uh, Michelle Alexander says, people of all races use and sell illegal drugs at remarkably similar rates. If there are significant differences in the surveys to be found, they frequently suggest that whites, particularly white youth, are more likely to engage in illegal drug dealing than people of color. That's, that, that's not a stereotype, right, that the media portrays, or that we would think from how uh, prisons look. Uh, and, in fact, drugs were always a proxy, kind of a camouflage term in order to round up certain people, certain undesirables. So in the 1870s, it was Chinese people. They were thought to be bringing opium, and they probably were, but they weren't the only drug users. But when we talked about drugs or opium, then it was Chinese folks. In the early 20th century, it was uh, Mexican folks in the Midwest and the Southwest. And then Latino and black communities are subject to wildly disproportionate drug enforcement sentencing. So this is the result. Between 1960, oh, sorry, 1960 and 2010, that is the growth in each category of our prison population. Wow. Okay, so this raises a few questions. How do we look at this? What is the government response? First of all, what is our relation to offenders? Is this other harm or self-harm? And uh, Genesis 9 and Romans 13 talk about other harm, essentially. That this is, that's the primary thing of uh, what the state, the police, the laws are supposed to protect against. Self-harm, it's, it's less clear what we do about that. Like, what do you do with a person who attempts suicide? Well, have they committed uh, a, a wrong? Yeah, against themselves. But is that a criminal offense or is that a medical public health issue? Well, it's a medical thing. You probably would not uh, throw someone into prison for attempting suicide. You put them in a hospital. Does that make sense? Self-harm is, is different from other harm. And there is a recognition in scripture about that. So when we are dealing with other harm, uh, what do we do? Well, in, in terms of what our society currently does, we tend to incarcerate them. Why do we do that? There, there's actually not agreement about why we do that. So there are some people who say it's because we take away freedom. Those are the people who tend to be libertarian. 
right? Because if that's your mode, then what, what is the appropriate punishment? It's to take away your freedom individually. Is it to cause pain? Well, if that's, if your primary view of justice is meritocratic retributive, then you do that. Some people, actually there was one person at Harvard Law who was utilitarian and uh, it, uh, her, her colleagues were like, what, you, you're that? Which is, it's a deterrent. We can deter other people from committing crime, so we just have to punish someone, right? Like a, a scapegoat, punish someone so that other people know we're serious about punishment. But whether they're actually guilty or innocent, or whether this is proportional to their crime, hmm, doesn't really matter. They're like, what? What? That, but that is the utilitarian uh, can. Now, I think scripture would have us land here. It's to ultimately help offenders repair the harm to human victims. It's restorative justice. Why do I think that? It's because of, uh, first of all, let me step you through some scripture and some opinions about scripture. So, how does God handle sin? Right In the fall, that is primarily self-harm. Although there's other harm involved. Uh, but what does God do? He tries to restore people right away. So the first thing is that he says, you, you gotta, I'm gonna promise I'm gonna overcome this problem in human nature, and you can't be in the garden anymore. Why? It's because I don't want you to immortalize the corruption in your body. Right, your human nature is damaged, I don't want that to be permanent. I can undo that with Jesus. So Irenaeus, is one of the earliest theologians outside the New Testament. This was his opinion. Wherefore, also, he drove them out of paradise and removed him far from the tree of life, not because he envied him the tree of life, as some venture to assert, but because he pitied him and did not desire that he should continue a sinner forever, nor that the sin which surrounded him should be immortal, an evil, interminable, and irremediable. Big words. That's your name. Methodius of Olympus. Uh, that's him getting martyred here. He's, he got his head cut off. It says, this is now the third century. In order then that man might not be an undying or ever living evil, as would have been the case if sin were dominant within him, as it had sprung up in an immortal body and was provided with immortal sustenance, God for this cause pr pronounced him mortal and clothed him with mortality. So that's the purpose of the fact that we die. It's not primarily a punishment as if God was saying, or a retributive punishment. It's because it's easy to read that and think, hmm, my experience of my parents was, I stole a cookie and so I get sent to my room. So this is just a bigger version of that, right? Like I cause you pain and so God says, I will cause you pain. Is that how God is? No. What God is doing is uh, preventing further harm. So this is Gregory of Nazianzus, probably the most important, venerated theologian of the early church. And he says, uh, in order that sin may not be immortal, thus his punishment is changed into a mercy. For it is in mercy and persuaded that God inflicts that particular punishment. Does that make sense? So that's how they were reading Genesis 3. Why? Well, let me go quickly through a couple Old Testament passages to show Jewish law is restorative. There's this, if men have a quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, does not die, but remains in bed if he gets up and walks around outside on a staff, then he who struck him shall go unpunished. He shall only pay for his loss of time and shall take care of him until he is completely healed. That's the goal of Jewish law. Restoration of the person, restoration of relationship, that's the goal. Right after that is what follows an eye for an eye, for an eye tooth for tooth stuff. But you know what? Jewish rabbis never read that in a way, it could be because Donald Trump says that's his favorite verse. An eye for an eye. Because it's retributive, or at least it seems that way. But Jew, the Jewish rabbis never read it that way. The early church didn't read it that way. It was saying, what that is is, well, that's an outer limit for compensation, financial, often financial and maybe lashes, but essentially, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an outer limit of proportionality. 
the victim gets to say, this is what I need to move on or to be healed. And uh, John and I were talking about this earlier this week, and he said, oh, an eye for an eye is not actually that uh, if I poke out your eye that someone else pokes out my eye, but that uh, I become a second eye for you. It's an eye for an eye. I become your eye. Does that make sense? I think that was awesome. So, and, and it's a question of, if I bring someone down, am, am I brought down? Or if I bring someone down, am I, am I involved in restoring that person up? Do two people go down, or do two people go up? That's the difference between retributive justice and restorative justice. And notice this is very uh, oriented towards the healing. So uh, what does this mean? It means, for instance, that I, you know, I read a lot of websites when Terrence Crutcher was, um, was shot. And there, even, there was a surprising number of people who said, well, he had a criminal history, which is true. But the, the, I think they were saying that in order to, at number one, suggest that he was menacing the police officer somehow. Right? This is the, the guy who uh, was shot by Betty. Um, and, and that somehow he, his, his life wasn't worth as much anyway. Right? Like he was not just a person, he was a criminal. And the, the flip side to that is, well, do you have to be a saint to have rights? I mean, is that what we're saying? Is you have to be a saint to have rights? Like, you can have no, no criminal background whatsoever. Like, that's the only type of person that we should really be outraged about when police overstep their bounds. No, that is not what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to restore people. And there, there are other ways to handle the situation if you need to escalate it if you're a police person. I have friends on the police force. So this, I'm not being anti-police. There are other ways to handle a situation that honors the person in the event of that kind of real uncertainty. So uh, there are other folks who have seen that Christian approaches are restorative when it comes to criminal justice. Okay, starting from Israel to the Christianized Roman Empire, more recently, these folks, I can give you more examples if you want, but for the sake of time. Uh, I, I want to compare this also because uh, this is kind of where our constitutional rights come from. So uh, this is the Code of Hammurabi, which says essentially, you, if you commit a crime, the punishment for your crime depends on how rich or poor your victim was. That's amazing. If a man has broken another man's limb, his own shall be broken. If a man has destroyed an eye or a limb of a poor man, he shall pay one mana of silver which is uh, much less of the amount. Now, over here in Leviticus 24, Moses, or God, says, if a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. There, that is, well, that's how it was handled. But uh, there, before that, there is the victim's right to name a compensation. Exodus 21 is really important because the things that are said in Exodus 21 are meant, are, that's the first time the Ten Commandments are expanded upon, and so it, that's the first time God is saying, this is how you handle a situation. And so you're meant to remember those lessons all the way through, every other time you read uh, the Jewish law. Does that make sense? So again, you, we have to be in the mode of synthesizing these things. So it, it is a restorative paradigm uh, that is fair. And this is the principle of the 14th Amendment, right, is equal treatment under the law. This is what has just been demolished by different Supreme Court cases. Uh, this one, City of Los Angeles versus Adolph Lyons, where basically the Supreme Court says you can't challenge a police department on their practices. You don't have the right to do that. That's what that looked like. McCleskey versus Kemp in 1987, uh, where the, the court said, we admit 
that was the state of Georgia practices the death penalty in a racially biased way. But as long as no one says this is why McCleskey should get the death penalty because he's black, as long as no one says that, we think it's fair. Like explicit racial bias, that's wrong. But implicit racial bias, that's fine. So in other, in other words, as long as the jury doesn't say it's because he's black that we want the death penalty, that that's what we're calling for, it's okay. Whatever other motivations are there, we just accept that. So this is, uh, was called the worst Supreme Court decision since Dred Scott, I think. Anyway, this is enough. And then on the prosecution side, whether a criminal or a, uh, someone accused gets funneled into the federal system or the state system, the federal is more, it's tougher, it's more stringent, the state more lenient. And so whether, who gets sent where, that's another point in the criminal justice system. Uh, black defendants regularly get sent more often to the federal system white defendants get sent more often to the state. And the Supreme Court says, basically, you can't challenge that. It's just the prosecutor's right. Wow. Wow. So this is how our prison system has gotten stacked. This is how our police departments are operating and what. Uh, so uh, plea bargaining is another aspect. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't go into that. But it is. It is important also. So, if you want to take action on this kind of thing, there's a few good organizations. My favorite is Families Against Mandatory Minimums. Uh, they track all kinds of legislation that's passing through state and federal uh, uh, tables and being discussed. So, you could look at that. Drug policy action also is another. And then, uh, I know at Tufts and hopefully Harvard, I'm going to start up these groups on the new Jim Crow. So you do be praying for that. that actually, and Sarah knows this one, but at, at Tufts, the gospel choir director uh, is giving extra credit points for taking this with us. So it's very exciting. 